So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Krzysztof Michalski, and I'm to welcome you here on behalf of the Institute for Human Sciences at Boston University, one of the organizers of the events of today. It is a part of a series, uh, actually a 12th event in, in this series of conversations uh, the Institute uh, organized together with the a number of other institutions, Center for International Relations at Boston University, International uh, Literary Journal AGNI, American Literary Translation, uh, uh, Translators Association, and Zephyr Press. The, there, were, uh, there was a number of very prominent uh, European artists uh, who spoke here, Bernhard Schlink, uh, Mrs. Varda, uh, Mr. Akstaga, British poet Simon Armitage, and others. Uh, so today, today event is a conversation with a very eminent uh, artist who comes uh, from Poland, uh, but works uh, and lives in several other countries, uh, mostly in the United States, uh, Poland, and I understand France. Uh, he has worked. Uh, almost everywhere. Yeah. The, his work uh, was shown at various exhibitions all over the world, actually, and uh, he also studied uh, in various countries uh, after Poland, uh, MIT, and other American institutions, uh, as well as Paris. Uh, he got uh, he, he was awarded a, a number of important prizes, uh, uh, relatively recently Hiroshima Prize for, the, for his contribution as an artist to the world peace. It was almost 10 years ago. But uh, he will himself uh, uh, tell you about his work. Uh, today, it, uh, the title is, uh, of his talk is Art, Trauma and Democracy, Immigrants and veterans. I understand that he has worked with immigrants uh, uh, for quite some time in various countries. Uh, a, uh, Mark Feeney, uh, editor from Boston Globe, uh, kindly agreed uh, to lead the conversation. Mr. Bodisco, please take this hall. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm not sure if this uh, microphone I was supposed to. Yeah, wait. Thank you. Works. Um, can you hear me well? So <clears throat> it's it's true that I've been um, working in many places, and and I crossed many borders. But it's important to say that um, in the uh, 70s, I crossed a border that uh, is no longer there. That is the border between uh, <coughs> uh, non-democratic country and the countries uh, uh, that are providing democratic conditions for life. So. <coughs> Once I left uh, uh, Poland, the non-democratic Poland, I was extremely busy trying to find this democracy. Uh, I was chasing after this uh, uh, phantom of democracy. I thought that since it was taken away from us <coughs> uh, somewhere else, I will find it. But soon I realized that uh, democracy is not to be found. It's something actually uh, that is always to come, avenir or devenir, something uh, that has a, a quality of a horizon. Uh, but in fact, democracy is the process in which uh, the citizens, residents, should participate actively and make democracy every time they do something in that direction, in that towards that horizon. 
Otherwise, it was just slipping back to where I came from, meaning to the authoritarian situation. So it's clear that I had to figure out how myself I could contribute to this process called the democracy. Um, it's clear that uh, uh, this process has something to do with public space, uh, with the city. And city is, has been always a hope for uh, newcomers. In fact, democracy could be measured by the openness, the level of openness of the city towards newcomers. And the reverse the level of uh, lack of openness could be actually used as a measurement of catastrophe. For example, Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed because they were mistreating strangers, abusing them, or closing gates against them. So there is a relationship here between this journey towards democracy or making of a democracy, and the situation of strangers or this or the estranged, and uh, the public space as a stage for this democratic process, not only physical but also electronic, digital. It's a physical stage, but also this this public space this seems to be like an essential component of, of our thinking of democracy. It's supposed to be empty. It's supposed to not belong to anybody. It should be ready to be open to anybody who comes in and brings the meaning to it and recognizes others in that space. And more, it spreads and disseminates the issue of rights that is actually contributing to the, uh, to the ex extension or expanding the access to rights by those who at this point have very limited access to them. Well, that's the definition of Claude Lefort from 1970s of, uh, of public space. That's public space does not exist. It's uh, actually it's being barricaded by some who speak and use it at the expense of others who are silent, who cannot open up and share their experience and recognize the others and and actually gain more access to rights. Of course, we have all right to rights as Hannah Arendt said. It's just a question, of course, how can we get there? This image is from some uh, uh, newspaper, probably from Switzerland. I'm not sure. What well, you can see here, someone on the left sitting as an object of the gaze of the couple on the right. He's being framed. He's being uh, identified. He's being, uh, he's being uh, seen as a stranger. So he is avoiding the gaze. He's looking somewhere else. So the issue is, of course, how could this situation change? What it is that we could do? Uh, especially what it is that, in my particular case, what it is that artists and designers can do. How can any project be created to, uh, to establish something in between the couple on the right and the person on the left? So the person on the left could initiate a discourse or open oneself or, or come uh, forward with unsolicited opening and transmission of own experience to, 
to the couple on the right. That's one problem. And another issue is how would this couple on the right come closer, open up the ear, and without fear, without fear, and without uh, preconceived notion, just learn, become a student for change. So right now, of course, he's, he's the, on the left is a passive figure in the urban landscape, usually smiles, just in case. Immigrants always smile. So it won't make any troubles. But in fact, if we are talking about democracy in public space, there is a very important concept here, which uh, I also learned in my journey towards trying to get close to this horizon of democracy. It's, there is a need for people who will introduce very important issues, disrupt the passivity and silence of the city, and insert the public space with what is not expected, what is maybe called private, what is relegated to the realm outside of public interest, but something that actually needs to be addressed, such as experience of displacement or the perspective on the country uh, of the newcomer who is a, has serious doubts about old country from which he or she arrived, and also serious doubts about new country, seeing freshly what's wrong. In fact, saying, it is wrong for me, I am outside of this, uh, of this space of, the, of, the, of rights, the public space, sure. But also I see that if there is something wrong with my situation, there is something wrong, period, with the situation of everybody. So this person could say quite a lot. In fact, could uh, function as someone uh, who is parasiastic speaker, uh, referring to uh, ancient Greek concept of, uh, of a free speaker without whom there would be no democratic process. Those people should be the first to receive the possibility of opening up and <clears throat> speaking critically, ethically, to announce and denounce what's wrong. They should, in fact, be uh, among all, many others who are those others actually armed, equipped with uh, capacity to, uh, to uh, engage a city in discourse that is not there to disrupt the silence around very important issues, such as the situation of people like himself, speaking from the heart, stomach, and mind, directly, speaking the truth, and opening up the whole uh, world of philosophical, legal, and, uh, and psychological domain to, see, to really uh, make the city more intelligent. So this kind of parasitic speaker, of course, is not going to speak just because someone gives him a microphone. Why? Because. <clears throat> First of all, would not have any confidence that it would make any difference. Secondly, just hearing oneself saying things would already cause certain uh, 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 certain kind of uh, uh, process of closing, closing oneself. Meaning, just listening to certain things will uh, cause a silence. Why? Because this person is traumatized. So now the issue of public space, democracy, and stranger is connected with a need to create conditions for traumatized people 
to regain confidence and capacity to open up and share and find words and metaphors to, to, transmit, uh, to transmit something for which there's actually no word or it's very difficult to find one. So that means whatever has to be created in between, the couple on the right and the person on the left, a thing in between has to have lots of uh, capacities. It will be infused by some content, substance, and transmit, and at the same be curious, strange enough, to bring attention of those people, direct attention on itself, the third object. So, what would this be? I, I try to design obj such object. And it's been a, a long process of, of uh, implementing this object, this instrument, in uh, Stockholm, in Helsinki, in uh, Warsaw, in Paris, in Marseille, in Barcelona, where actually the project began in uh, uh, 1991. Uh, and many other places, in immigrants were using the equipment uh, designed by myself, true, but they infuse it with their own uh, stories. So in the top of this equipment, you see a little monitor, and there's a speaker, and also containers, very important, plexiglass containers through which you can see precious relics. The immigrants have uh, been collecting uh, uh, objects, memorabilia, documents that are witnesses of their displacement and journey. Of course, there are many of those objects that may become part of what's being recorded and is being uh, pr uh, transmitted through the top of this walking stick, uh, where is a, a speaker and a little monitor. Or it might not, not have any relation to this. Someone might ask, what's there? And the immigrant might say, it's none of your business. This is something I need to have. Or it might actually say, oh, this is actually that document, uh, number f uh, 15 kind of document of deportation, or this is a, a family photograph or broken family cap, which in fact is a symbol of my broken ties with my Italian culture. Or anything else. So you can see, of course, What's happening here? The, the, the thing in between is actually speaking on its own. It's all of those terrible things that one wants to say and difficult things to say can be recorded over time. Recorded, re-recorded, edited, to the point that it's all said. When it's all said, then the person is becoming a mediator be between what is already said and what is about to be uh, discussed. So then, f therefore, there is, this is an immigrant double. So that, who is that the person here on the left? It's equivalent of the couple on the right. In the first image, it's the person who is uh, curious. This is the second person, or maybe it's a third person. We don't know. And then there will be fourth person. So there will be this immigrant, the double of an immigrant, the other who is properly alienated, estranged from the immigrant. And then there will be another person who will come and ask question, what are you two talking about in relation to this object? So we'll take a, a larger position, maybe political, maybe legal position. There will be a position of the third as Levinas would say. So the first, the second, the third. In other words, then there are more people, more of those thirds, and then it becomes a crowd around this walking stick, which becomes like a center of the universe. 
It's a, it, it actually designates sacred ground, ground of, of the space that allows for unleashing of passions. So that the democ democracy is being created right in this spot, at least for a moment. Why? Because disagreements is becoming a converging point of, of mul multiplicity of various positions and disagreements around the person who is a stranger, who is in fact announcing or actually beginning of the community, the new community, community to come, the city to come. Well, sometimes, and I witness various uh, situations, uh, people got involved so much, both immigrants and non-immigrants, in discussion of serious existential and political matters that they went to restaurant with this object and they continued discussion, they left, and they left the object. They forgot about the object. The object was unnecessary. Then they would run, of course, back and pick it up. Uh, no, those containers are interchangeable. Therefore, it's possible for many people to use the same instrument uh, changing uh, those containers. So this, um, I'd like to maybe show a little bit of, of the same project in motion. Before I do, the slides are good because you can see many details. This is this famous broken uh, cap uh, from Family Service, you know, the little precious thing that sta stands for home and culture. Of course, uh, <laughs> As you can see, there are lots of discussions among immigrants here because there is a myth that immigrants understand each other. In fact, there could be, a, we can imagine, an enormous amount of conflict developed among various immigrant populations uh, struggling for limited resources and competing for them. Therefore, uh, of course, there is another issue here. There are two people of color in Stockholm who are uh, operating, uh, or performing, operating, using those instruments. They are, in fact, artists of their, of their own right, because they are storytellers, performers. Well, what is interesting that this person will immediately ask the two uh, users, oh, you two, where are you from? As if they needed to be from the same place because they have the same color. Well, they are from Africa, actually, but from two different parts of Africa that are divided by enormous amount of miles and cultural differences. One of them speaks seven languages, another speaks six languages, and they share maybe one or two, well, Swedish included. So then, of course, they had to explain uh, the, uh, what do you mean, us? What is us? Who are you to frame us this way? But also, why are you asking this question? Where are you from? What? Why? Of course, it's a very generous question. We understand. It's very nice of you that you are curious. But, it's an insult for us because it suggests that we are work of geography in your mind. R why don't you ask us what are we doing? What's our labor? Work. We are work of work. Or maybe you ask this question because you are playing this game, like with yourself. How clever you are that you probably detected our accent. So you would like to now be sure that you are right, first place, that you figure out from where that person is. So why should I actually operate as an object in your game? How ah, clever you are. So. <clears throat>
else instruments multiplied and they have certain mutations and some of them were more cyborgian because there was a relation between immigrant and cyborg. Or a cyborg meaning not just simply mixture of artificial and natural, but rather what Donna Harvey in the 70s explained to us, it's a kind of capacity of, 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 of that being called cyborg to smoothly move from the artificial to natural back and forth between two different cultures, between mother tongue and new language. It's fact becomes a kind of baroque personality as Kristeva uh, so those are supplementary instruments, equipment, uh, speaking. This is a person who is... Uh, hey, hey. So you see, this person from Ethiopia is speaking French and Russian in Helsinki. With, uh, This is one type of project. Which is providing this special equipment, speech act equipment. But there is another type of project I develop uh, with immigrants because it's not about them necessarily or on behalf of them, it's with. It's important. Uh, in which they are becoming, with time, the process of their uh, the kind of psychological investment in which they are uh, learning what to say, why to say things, and how to say things. So they dry information, facts, related to their displacement are gradually becoming emotionally, emotionally charged uh, testimonies that are uh, then becoming not so traumatic, but maybe post-traumatic. There is more and more uh, narration and more and more distance, more and more play, and more and more, 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 and more sense of humor. So they're becoming less and less immersed in their own very specific conditions, but they see also themselves as potential agents that who will then help to uh, uh, animate the city with the discourse that might eventually help to, uh, to provide a change, the change for, uh, for everybody. So the immigrant utopia is not just a, a kind of space far away uh, impossible, non-space, non, non it's actually a different kind of space. It's a space that could be called no place. No exclamation mark place. It's a place I refuse to accept. I know this place, I am, it's a ground in which I operate, tactically, sure, but I refuse to accept it for myself, for my children, and for all of you, because there's something wrong here, in hope that saying so and explaining it and talking about it might contribute to conditions under which there will be no place for this place in the future. That's no place, utopia. Also, no place, utopia is also considered as good place in, in uh, definitions that I found. Well, all right, maybe it's a good place, but it's good in quotation marks place. It's so-called good place. What's good for? What, you, what, what you are providing for me, your great home, is a labyrinth for me. What's good for you, it may be bad for me. 
So this is um, the promise of this type of work. I would like to show you another project which uh, uh, was developed with uh, uh, organization called Sans Papier in uh, Basel. It's an organization that operates in many countries. It's uh, working to help people without documents. Uh, it's important to know that this, those projects will not exist without somebody who uh, gained trust among potential operators, co-artists in those projects, uh, who also trust the project. The social workers, the organizers, psychotherapists, and uh, cultural animators, whoever, uh, whoever is working already uh, in similar uh, democratic projects, project. So this sans papier seem to be very uh, effective uh, in supporting various cultural projects. In Switzerland, the situation is so grave when it comes to uh, experience and uh, position of an immigrant that uh, political projects, of course, cannot simply uh, succeed. In fact, it's a long series of, uh, of uh, of uh, measures uh, in Switzerland that are just continuously against immigrants. Been, uh, don't have all those facts somewhere here I could quote in the discussion, uh, during the discussion. It's just amazing how, un how xenophobic uh, politics is in Switzerland. So to the point that, as you can see here uh, on this, in this image, this is uh, hardly visible at night, but you will see very soon once the projection starts. It's a famous building called Kunstmuseum in, uh, in Basel. It's a landmark building. It's an it's a icon of the city. It stands for identity of Castle, of, of Basel. Much Castle, probably a similar situation. It's culture, it's a city of culture. So uh, with the help of Saint Papier and a group of uh, illegal immigrants who all agreed to be part of the project on condition that their faces won't be visible or actually they won't be recognizable, even the sound of their voice will be altered enough so nobody will ever recognize them, nor that they will be uh, participating in public in any events, they, uh, uh, they uh, decided to speak. So I, um, with them, I developed a very simple technique that you already uh, detected from the first image, that they would uh, uh, take over this building, at least symbolically. It's just a building. When the Leute mich fragen, ob ich wollte, du kommst, das finde ich normal. Ich denke, die Leute wollen einfach. Sie leben da mit meiner Mutter. Ja. Wir sind mit Kollegen da. Zwei Jahre. Und wir leben da. Denke ich mal. Und jetzt mit den Seelen. Wirklich meine Traumberufe. Sie sind auch da. Er war äh, Automechaniker. Weil für mich ich ist das mein Leben geworden. Und ich habe gemeint, ja, ich habe das fast das ist erreicht. Ich habe auch ein Teil meines Lebens geworden. Und auch ein Teil von mir. Das ist immer meine Ausrede. Weil ich illegal bin in der Schweiz. Ich habe Ahora vivo fast mis hijos. Die, die Kollege von mir weiß es. So they were speaking uh, simultaneously, as if they were just sitting there. Uh, of course, it's important that uh, the public needed to really look up yes, very high. So the issue is not so much about making those people bigger, but making ourselves smaller. So our position will be like children who are trying to learn something. 
from uh, them as teachers. It's a kind of reverse situation in terms of performance and theater, of which uh, Rancière is uh, writing a lot. Uh, it's about uh, reversing a little bit the situation because there's so much we could learn from those people. They see the world, they see the city from the point of view of the wound, of its wound. So it's not a joke to actually, uh, and also, of course, uh, they are there, both uh, actors, script writers, and uh, they are, in fact, philo they are actually developing the whole script. So, in fact, it was not much that I instructed anybody here. It was all about simply uh, developing uh, their speech, creating conditions under which uh, they could freely develop their speech. So, in, a, in some ways, my position uh, as a kind of artist who takes responsibility for all of this is closer to what Derek Winnicott called good enough mother. Somebody who is there to protect certain freedom, capacity of those people to develop, to in fact redevelop their ability to speak. Because those abilities uh, are frozen. It's like unfreeze the, f the, f the f kind of the situation of failure. Meaning they are frozen in their the incapacitation. So to unfreeze it, it, it takes time. So they would come and leave. They would take advantage of my absence. They would meet somewhere else. Some of them will never show up again. Somebody else will come. They will measure and think and have in, in, an intuition to realize how can make use of this project. Their first uh, response usually is, no, we don't want to be part of this project. We've seen before too many journalists and artists and filmmakers who make career sense to, to, to sensationalize, to make a romantic stories about it. Whatever uh, they've done has nothing to do with us. So only once the project is rejected and psychologically destroyed, and the project survives the destruction. Then, uh, in the next stage, uh, those potential uh, co-artists might realize that the project is strong enough to possibly be used, to be used, to be uh, to be useful for them, intuitively or if consciously, or both. So this is the process that is true both with instruments and with projections, with every other project I developed. It takes time. To work with people is very different than to work with objects and materials in artist's studio. They are not materials. So that's uh, something, uh, of course, the statement more maybe makes more sense to uh, the audience that is struggling with the shift from uh, studio art to art that actually is with developing with people towards uh, uh, the, the public domain, not just public space, but public domain. Now, another project uh, which uh, I like to show is uh, the one that just ended. It's been uh, uh, almost six months of a display of the project in Venice. The par as a, I was invited to uh, develop a project for Polish pavilion in, in, uh, in Giardini, in Venice Biennale. So, of course, Polish pavilion, Poland, representing Poland. I am Polish, <laughs> but it's also Europe, European community, and Poland is part of European community. The borders are no longer there. It's, uh, there are other borders. There is a border outside of Europe. There's a Chinese wall being built. Europe is being now defined as, as not, not Europe, 
it's seeing itself as not somebody else. Who, who is this somebody else? It's probably the ones who is crossing the border illegally and so forth. So, um, yeah, it's difficult to, rec to see what kind of pavilion I should actually uh, create. What is this pavilion? What is the interior of a pavilion, first place? What does it mean uh, to do projection or project or installation inside under those circumstances? Whose inside is that? Is it an inside of those others, or it's our inside, or it's an interior, in kind of our own interiority? Or, or, or who, who, what are the walls here? All of this mass of questions that uh, cross my mind once I enter that strange Giardini. During the winter, all the pavilions are empty. Some of the doors are partially open. The cold wind, the blow of wind from those catacombs of national identity is blowing. It's a very strange feeling. So I definitely have to brace myself for uh, for this um, project, for, I didn't have much time because they usually announce those decisions very late. <laughs> so um, what I decided to do is to invest this pavilion with windows, using projectors, of course. No windows in pavilion, it's all strange name for pavilion without windows in the garden. So why not using this kind of equipment to project images of windows with the view of somebody on the other side, but with the view that is not clear. Well, this is the thing. You could say it's like realism, 19th century realism. You break the wall, the, the wall between reality and ourselves, between our interior and exterior, and to see fragment of something larger. Well, that's true, maybe true, but at the same time, it's important to realize that we have very foggy idea about those people from outside who, are, who actually are washing our windows. In in fact, they are repairing our facades. With, they are very busy to maintain our uh, surfaces and our exteriors, and our interiors as well. They are taking care of our children, of our, old, of our grandparents, our parents. No, it, they, without them, we cannot live, but we know nothing about them. And we don't want to know much about them. So it's a very strange thing. Some of us actually used to be immigrants. We are immigrant countries. Poland, big tradition. Why do I want not to know much about it? Because my own immigrant unconscious will come up. This is uncanny. I need to actually confront the uncanny, not only try to recognize something that I want to reject. Of course, the strangeness is within me. The appearance of actual stranger uh, triggers something that's supposed to be hidden and comes to light. You know, that's a frightening situation. So how to do, get a little closer to those people without identifying and framing them the way this couple on the right did uh, to, to the person on the left. At the same time, how to uh, create an image of that foggy distance between us. So create something that is not this and not that. Create a difficult project to the point that I have difficulties to talk about this because it's still too fresh. I, this project is still somehow um, working through my own uh, mind. But just to share with you some images. this. Uh, those are the, the, the type of windows, uh, milky windows, that are very strange because they provide light. They have to be clean. So you, you see people only when they get closer. And they, when they get very close, it's frightening. They're almost breaking through. You see details. But then they disappear again. You don't know whether they actually see you or not. 
those people. Well, sometimes, when you really, at least they might try. We don't know, but yes, you might know if you try yourself, but if you are inside, you might imagine that maybe they're observing you, but, but or worse, they might not have any interest to know about you. Like those brigades that renovate buildings and they suddenly appear in scaffoldings very close to you. They watch you. Every, you're in your bedroom, your bathroom, and worse, they don't care, even, maybe. So they have other problems of which you know nothing, like this one, the papers, the documents. What is this? ID, pièce d'identité. What is this? Who am I? So the windows with people who are waiting for uh, to be, they wait all day for one car to arrive and pick up one of them for their job, right, in, in Rome. Or there are people who work, who descend, who actually take, maintain the building or, or even skylight. Are there people who are works of work? Busy doing things and also talking to each other, talking on the phone to somebody in another country in strange language. So you have to have headphones in this pavilion to actually get the translation. You are actually e dropping, you try to get the sense of what they're talking about. Uh, and what they are talking about is not that nice for both Polish viewers, visitors, and Italian visitors, and maybe other visitors. They also repair the frame. Lots of noise. It's a kind of revenge. Like those immigrants in California who are carrying those huge machines blowing the leaves. Uh, they are nobody and they actually take over <laughs> that space, uh, consciously or not, as pleasure or not. So those, uh, of course, inside, who are we? Who are we? Are we maybe strangers ourselves. It's us who are alienated from them. That's for sure. Let's not think that they are only alienated from us. So, with this I'd like to show a uh, uh, little bit of a film. So there are some positive yeah, statements about Polish people here, but in the context of somebody who is escaping from revenge of the family from Africa, she is hiding in Poland, terrorized by the family, not by some wars in Africa, by vicious uh, uh, or somebody here from uh, from uh, Libya, an intellectual who ended up in Poland in transition or detention center for immigrants because of Dublin Convention. So he's talking about this in Arabic to some friend in in uh, in Libya, uh, trying to explain why he is in fact in Warsaw. He is, has is a professor of chemistry, and he, in fact, has colleagues in Germany where there is a job for him waiting. Why is he more so? Because he bought on the black market a visa. He was about to be killed, prosecuted, by some, uh, for some uh, helping some resistance in his own country. So he bought on the black market a visa. It was a Polish visa. It happened to be Polish visa. So he landed in Warsaw. 
And according to Dublin Convention, no matter what one could do and wants to do in other countries, his or her case has to be processed in the country of entry. So he received in Germany some letter from Poland saying, okay, you have to go back to Warsaw, and then suddenly it's all complete disaster. Nobody knows what to do. It's complete chaos. Uh, he's, uh, he is actually saying that um, um, that he's been uh, simply put on some b uh, concrete floor in some strange place. People with machine guns. They gave him some number. Nobody speaks English, and it's just just incredible. And he's just uh, actually calling his uh, uh, his brother uh, on the phone, which is a, a real conversation that was um, uh, recorded there. I'm afraid of my own people. So there is also another person who is uh, uh, so-called Vietnamese. In Poland, there is a third of numbers, third largest population of Vietnamese in the German are something like 60,000 people. Most of them are illegal. They have no documents. And in fact, what this person is saying in Polish, perfect Polish, trace of foreign accent. Uh, she actually has a, uh, he, she's an intellectual working as a part of a resistance network against communist uh, Vietnam. What is happening that uh, secret police, Polish secret police, collaborates with secret police in Vietnam, communist Vietnam, allowing the agents from Vietnam to come to Poland and interview in detention centers uh, uh, those who uh, who are asking for asylum from uh, from from uh, from Vietnam, and then at the end there is a deportation. Those people are sent back to Vietnam, usually to end up in prison or even being killed. There are lots of cases of people who lost their lives as a result of collaboration between Polish secret uh, police and and Vietnamese. So she is talking about this in Polish pavilion. I mean, on the other side of Polish pavilion. So. Those are uh, complicated situations because during the time of, uh, of the previous regime under authoritarian rule, there was certain understanding of the situation of people in Vietnam. Now, of course, uh, that's what actually she's saying through this glass of Polish pavilion, that now there is a wall between us because now we're free. Right, we lost, uh, we are foggy now. You know, we don't even want to know what we are going through. So, there were many of uh, our voices here uh, from Chechnya, also, a very important voice of uh, so-called gypsy. Also, there was a storm here uh, that interrupted the whole scene, just to um, create a little bit of a landscape, urban landscape situation. But what was interesting is that uh, this person here, uh, could you please? So what he's saying is that uh, that uh, people, so-called gypsies, the Romani, are allowed to study in schools until they are 14. And then once they leave the school in Italy, they actually end up without working papers, without any documents. So they are, they are pushed straight into alternative market and uh, black market and legal kind of labor. 
with all of the consequences for which they are being blamed. So it is a third and fourth generation of uh, residents of Italy who have no rights according to what he's saying. And he knows what he's saying. So, uh, and then uh, also he's talking about history. For those who are interested in, in, in history and memory, uh, the situation of, of, of people uh, Romani is very special. They were uh, objects of uh, uh, experimentations in concentration camps. They actually went through their uh, Holocaust, which is not as recognized as other Holocaust, obviously. In Italy, nobody is talking about this. So in fact, their identity is being erased. First of all, uh, their history and memory has been stolen by, uh, uh, by uh, every country in which they, uh, they happen to live. So they are people with no history. Uh, therefore, they are storytellers. They try to constantly produce some kind of history and memory. And secondly, those people are, uh, are, are, are saying like, if the, if the history doesn't exist, I don't exist. But also, if I don't have documents, if I don't have papers, the history doesn't exist. That's what he's saying. He's actually philosophizing the whole relation between identity, between documents, permits, and history, memory, and so forth. So a very appropriate thing to say in a public space, in a democratic process, because our cities, all those cities, are in fact could be seen as cities of the victors. Meaning that celebrate and commemorate those who succeeded and keep forgetting who didn't succeed. That's the kind of hermeneutical process of which Benjamin was speaking. So therefore, it's very important to try to project the memory and the tradition of the vanquished into the history of, of victors to somehow both show discrepancy and also to provide some kind of uh, uh, possibility of, uh, of introducing something as a legitimate history. Probably uh, he is basically doing this. He used this project to say so, uh, to do so. Yeah, he was, became an artist, co-artist in this project as a kind of uh, cultural interventionist project. So this uh, type of uh, work focusing on immigrants should not, of course, uh, say barricade and dominate uh, the whole uh, spectrum of various uh, experiences and various silences, which needs to be animated through public art and the critical public art or kind of performative developmental uh, psycho, uh, uh, psychosocial uh, work interventionist work. And uh, that's why I would like to uh, introduce another group and uh, won't take very long because we don't have much time left. That is uh, people who are uh, citizens, legitimate residents of our cities, who are kind of who grew up in our cities with all of the rights, they, and they, they, they uh, end up in a war zone somewhere else outside of our countries and they are coming back to their own places as people who cannot recognize themselves and who are not recognizable by the closest, who are foreigners and strangers of a very special kind, war veterans. The war veterans we in this country don't really understand uh, how many of war veterans are because those affected by war veterans are war veterans as well. They are families, friends, the closest, and uh, maybe even more, friends of friends, families of families. Each time the soldier who is traumatized comes back home, he re-traumatizes seven to nine people, according to the statistics. 
if they are called recalled several times, that perhaps we, if we calculate it well, a quarter of the United States population is traumatized by the war, with the new new troops being sent and masses of soldiers coming back, not killed but alive, but unrecognizable, wounded emotionally and physically because of new technology that actually brings them back alive. Those people train more than any time in history in the past to kill. The whole machine is developed scientifically to turn people into warriors. There is no machine to turn them back to people. So we're talking about uh, masses of people who want to protect their closest and people around them from themselves as warriors. They detach, they separate themselves, they become homeless. There is a massive casualty coming in this country. So it is true, not to the same degree, but frighteningly large degree in other countries in Europe, uh, especially in Britain, that is sending quite a large number of troops. And with all of the welfare system there that protects people much more and takes care of people more than any that no matter what we do here in Massachusetts, still far away from, from that protection that provided by the state in Europe. Keeping even this in mind, those people are not protected. They are, in fact, neglected. They suffer incredible <coughs> prejudice and lack of attention. And, of course, a complete lack of understanding of their condition. So. Saying this, I'd like to uh, share with you uh, uh, the project, which developed very recently uh, in uh, Liverpool. In Liverpool, uh, project uh, similar to the one that I developed earlier in Denver on occasion of Democratic Convention, uh, but much, I think, more advanced version of it and also more complex in its social dimension. It was based on, uh, on, on uh, adopting, appropriating uh, the war machine, the vehicle, which is an icon of the war. In the uh, American side, it's Humvee, which used to be helmet in Vietnam War. Now it's Humvee. In, uh, in Britain, it's Land Rover. Turning, uh, transforming the battle station that is designed to launch uh, projectiles into a projection battle station to launch images and sound. Uh, recorded, edited, recorded by war veterans themselves. And in, uh, uh, in Liverpool, uh, one, uh, one person who joined the project was uh, is a wife of a veteran. The per he, she never went to war, but she is at, uh, at war. She's trying to bring her husband back. He's next to her, and he also participates in this project, speaking on his own behalf. She cannot find him. He's, he's not there. He's, in fact, he has almost killed her twice without even remembering that. So she's talking about this uh, through this vehicle. So ideally, this vehicle actually should be operated by families of veterans, but it's still a long ways to go. Only 1% of veterans speak in public, and almost none of the veteran families speak in public, very, very rarely. So it's very difficult to, um, uh, to, do, to, to find uh, conditions for uh, this kind of engagement. But anyway, with uh, this project has been developed with the uh, organization called Combat Stress, 
What do you see here? It's very uh, looking strange slide. But in fact, it's uh, from the screen, a computer screen, uh, just to explain to you, we develop with uh, in our interrogative design group at MIT, this is my assistant, uh, uh, a special software, which allows to record words, so microphone, and very quickly uh, translate it into a blast of words projected from this vehicle and sounds with the particular combination of sounds and words uh, that are appropriate according to this uh, program. So, um, this uh, uh, equipment was, could you increase the sound, please? Oh, it's rosy, as you think. Even a little more, please. Even more second. Here today, gone tomorrow. So simple. So sad. We can be shot. he was talking to me, the looks he was giving me, I was like, oh my God, I think he could kill me, I think he could actually kill me now. He could put his hands around my throat and strangle me, you know. And I, I mean, it wasn't nasty. I'd just say, do you want a cup of tea? But the look in his eyes, and, and I, I thought, I can't, I think, I can't do this. I don't, it was just, he could have killed me. It, 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 even now he does it to me. And he looks at me as if I'm shite. It's, 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 it's like varnish. When you varnish a piece of wood and then you put paint strip in, strips away at everything. Strips away. It disturbs your sleep, your thoughts. Dreams, you nightmares, which I have a lot of them. And then I wake up through the night. You know my medication which helps a bit. But you still wake up. You, you wouldn't believe what I put air through. That was from 1982 after I come back. When I went to Germany in 1984, it's very interesting. I nearly strangled her. I can't remember that. She said, yeah, I didn't know. Well, if anyone can survive that time, you can s survive anything. People don't understand what a flashback is. Certain things will bring it out and spoil your day. Or your week or whatever. The sound and the drilling I don't like. Slamming doors. Slamming windows. I stand crowded places, I can't stand in a crowded place because I feel vulnerable. So there's always stancing me, me back to the wall or if, I, if I'm really feeling really bad, I'll just move out the room completely, I won't go, I won't go back in it because I feel vulnerable. But the media just don't seem to recognise that. All they want to do is sell papers. They... Politicians don't understand. They send the troops to wars and then they don't care when they come back. So I just say politicians don't care. They'll send you to war, but they won't look after you. So, perhaps I should stop at this point and in hope that there will be some time for a conversation, as it was announced earlier. Uh, if you still have patience and interest, please uh, stay and voice some thoughts and questions and also maybe uh, ideas. Uh, been uh, 
I'm preparing uh, myself for n more projects of this sort. There is one that is, uh, you can see at ICA in Boston. It's an interior projection. So it's again something to do with interiors. But perhaps I should not show any images of this uh, for those who didn't see it, who didn't go to, 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 uh, to this interior. Uh, to, um, to learn about the way I actually uh, made use with veterans and civilians from Iraq, the way I made use of this interior, uh, I, maybe I should not show. Uh, on the flat screen, something that needs to be perceived uh, in a very spatial way. So I encourage you to, uh, to visit ICA, uh, maybe as an extension of this uh, lecture. But uh, please um, um, say something, speak, ask questions. Mark Feeney, an arts writer with the Boston Globe. And I will probably ask a few questions, but as I'm doing so, if any of you out there have questions, you'll notice that there are microphones on each side of the room. Uh, tonight's event is being recorded by WBUR, so if you have questions, just go to the microphone and uh, stand there, and I'll recognize you, and you can ask your question. But I'll start off. Uh, Christoph, you, you mentioned D.W. Winnicott's idea of the good enough mother which I guess makes you the good enough artist. Uh, do you see yourself... Or bad enough artist. Bad, well, <laughs> do, do you see yourself more as catalyst than creator? Uh, your works are, are so collaborative. I mean, they really do rely on all these other people. To what extent do you see them as, as collaboration? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I tried to explain this process a little bit. Um, it's uh, it well if they if they can make good use of this kind of project for their life and for the life of others, it's their success. If they don't, it's my failure. Meaning that means I have done some bad uh, work <coughs> because didn't provide conditions or didn't prepare situation for them to make sense of it. So it's difficult to say. In fact, in according to this Winnicott uh, uh, concept of transitional object or phenomenon, <coughs> one should not formulate this kind of question <laughs> because it disrupts the whole transitional character. So in one point, they may decide to say that's Vodichko's work. It's not my work uh, because it's convenient for them or for some reason it sounds good in particular. Or they may say it's my, my words. I've been speaking there. There are uh, in Liverpool, uh, some of those veterans were still around. So their function was not only as script writers uh, and actors, but also as public relation people. And some of them were interviewed by BBC. There was, they were kind of in forefront of the whole project. That was an open session uh, with them and with uh, uh, the person from uh, Combat Stress. It was televised. So uh, I think that um, it will be unfair to really make that decision whose project it is at this point. But I take full responsibility for this uh, as an artist um, because it's definitely my idea to, to create this kind of object. And also it's important to see that the, what is being projected is as important as all of the process that led to this and also the fact that this vehicle is there, because this vehicle is um, standing for quite a great uh, 
chunk of experience of those people. Well, there's also an important distinction with the Liverpool work, with uh, Basel, with Denver, in that uh, if people want to see out of here the ICA uh, installation, they, they actively go into the building. They seek it out. Uh, if they go to the Polish Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, they seek it out. But there must have been many people in mm -hmm. Liverpool, in Denver, in Basel, who were just walking along and were suddenly confronted with these voices, these images, these words. How were the public uh, responses to these installations? Uh, before I answer to this question, which probably is not that easy for me because I don't uh, uh, record responses, but I have to say that there is another public being generated by those projects. I call it inner public, or it's kind of inner public sphere, perhaps even, of the project, artistic project, because there's so many people involved in the process of developing the project. Not only these organizations like Combat Stress, uh, but also if the production crew, and the video, people, the recording, uh, the, 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 the film recording crew, the projection, uh, the building of this vehicle. So, uh, and also lots of people who are f uh, friends of those who gave, it, uh, who, who, all, who made use of this project as co-artists. So, there is maybe eight, ten people speaking through this machine, but there may be 250 people already as Brecht would say, that part of the project not without interest. This is the public not without interest. Well, Brecht really would like this kind of public. Uh, not without reason as well. So those people are somewhere there as well. So they mixed with this public that is uh, there because of newspaper and media announcements. Uh, or internet uh, information, and also passerbys who are there, as you pointed out, who just were there because it's a it's a social space. So now those and some of those veterans are actually interviewing people and making their own programs. So it's it's a, it's a complete uh, uh, mixture. There, there is what's happening between those various publics. It's something that is difficult, of course, to imagine inside of the museum. However, I could say also that inside of the museum, it's a very public public because masses of people are going through those, especially during the weekends. There may be then their uh, family, a veteran, a veteran, somebody else. There may be some conversation afterwards in a, in the cafeteria or maybe later, it's hard to tell. Clearly, this is much more intense and complex situation. But it happens over a shorter time period. Why, in fact, the museum uh, exhibitions like six months, uh, eight or nine hours a day, except maybe one day. So it's, it's really accumulates an enormous amount of people and also media. It's important. Whatever you introduce, whenever you introduce a project that is media, has a media component, it brings media. So there will always be television and radio coming to those projects. Well, it looks like when it comes to ICA project, there was also a lot of media came. Um, project has a media aspect, there's the projection itself. So didn't maybe answered the question, what was the response of the audience? But maybe gave you some sense of the character of, a, of, of the interactions between various people. Uh, people are arguing over this. They have different opinions, different positions. Uh, sometimes could be, they could be against this kind of project. So this is important. Uh, what exactly people feel or they say it's hard, hard, hard to know. One time in Krakow, and that's a special place in my history and in Europe, 
uh, somebody was standing next to me and uh, saying in Polish, "Jak to jest możliwe, że że ktoś wierzy, wierzy?" It's, it's about the power of the tower. The tower makes everything believable. Wierzy, wiara, and uh, the meaning believe, and the tower is the same uh, word in Polish. And somebody else said, if I didn't know it was Vodichko, I would think it was a miracle. Because uh, usually images show on the towers. People have certain uh, relation to this. So what I'm trying to say that in the city, projecting something on symbolic uh, structures that are charged with the history of meaning, it's, it's a, a secondary or thir a third level of a projection. It's, uh, people already project a lot on those structures, and they are witnesses to many things that happened before. So to actually engage them in additional projection is not a minor matter. The, this, the, this vehicle was uh, traveling in five, six, uh, six or five different locations in Liverpool. The choice of the, of the, of the symbolic structure very important. Many of very good locations were not allowed because of restrictions of traffic and something else. So this, people talk about this as well. They, say, they, they, they remember what this place remembers. Well, the, the issue of memory, uh, you're clearly drawn to outcasts, to immigrants, uh, veterans, or if you will, internal outcasts. You yourself have connections to many different countries. Is it possible for you to say where you most feel at home in the world? My silence is already telling you something. <laughs> um, definitely my home is more in this country than in any other country. In this country, there are so many strangers. But as Freud would say, if everybody is a stranger, there is no stranger. Or at least we are getting closer to this utopia here rather than in my old country or uh, Europe. It's always very difficult to go to Europe uh, because uh, Europe has long ways to go. And to really understand how it is to actually imagine immigrant country <laughs> in any place. Uh, plus, uh, Poland specifically didn't really have time and chance to rethink critically, to deconstruct its own identity. Uh, it's been uh, in a time when France or Britain or, or uh, other countries or Spain went through the whole uh, rethinking of their colonial past or their colonial uh, identity or, or, whole, or kind of ideologies. Uh, Poland, who went through a very thick colonial period, doesn't even want to recognize this fact that 17th century Poland was a colonial empire. <laughs> but no, we always, because of modern history, we always are on the victim side or being objects of colonialization. So now, when the immigrants are pouring into our borders because of the change of geopolitical change, uh, uh, suddenly, uh, uh, we don't want to remember that we've been, Ukraine was our colony, our dominium, that Lithuania was our colony, that Belarus was our colony, that, that we had some strange ideas about uh, Africa and Madagascar. No. We're seeing those people. We're not prepared to really recognize uh, what it, what, it, what, it, and we also don't want to remember our own history of migration. So it's not easy. And of course, for anybody who, uh, who, em who uh, emigrated, who established their own place somewhere else, re so called return to the country of origin 
is a shock, always. Because it's not only that people seem to be not as changed as you, right, who are coming back, but also you start recognizing in your old country yourself the one whom you left, the one who you don't want to be anymore. So if you say, where I feel at home, Maybe I feel at home in undoing my Polishness. It seemed to be a laboratory, deconstructive laboratory. Whenever I travel, I undo myself because I've been done. I've been constructed, made by my own cult culture. Uh, undoing this, but I'm undoing this in a very Polish way. I'm sure that's the way to be Polish, <laughs> is to be un-Polish. And this is something uh, that's something between me and me, of course. But I'm confessing that maybe for the first time in public, <laughs> uh, provoked by a very uh, generous question. So, yes, I feel at home in trouble, definitely. Uh, and many immigrants began migration in their own countries, as we discussed before, the, uh, before uh, the session. Uh, they, that, it's not everybody is leaving. The, the, the departure is, is, has to start earlier. So perhaps this deconstructive process was there before. I even, uh, uh, I never really left Poland anyway. Poland decided where I live. One day I received a telephone call from Polish consulate in Toronto. And I went there and consul told me, the country is under opinion that citizen lives here permanently, meaning in Canada. So the decision was made for me. <laughs> so in that sense, how can I say that I left Poland? And at that Poland that left me is no longer there. So. I have now Polish passport again. I received it recently. Let me finish with a very specific question. You mentioned early on uh, the racism of the Swiss. What's your response to uh, last weekend's referendum on minarets? Hmm. Did that surprise you at all? No, it didn't surprise me because during the several years ago project in Basel was in fact partially in anticipation of a big referendum. It, the issue is, uh, was, it always is, uh, it, when one can be legalized in Switzerland. So it was the idea that maybe after like six years, maybe 12 years, one could become, no. It actually looks like it's one of the uh, largest percent, it's actually the largest percentage of foreign born people in Switzerland, of any country in Europe. At the same time, the chance for them to become citizens is almost zero. The restrictions are such that even if one fulfills all of the rules, there is still a local, the community board that decides that there are in every canton, every city, there are special citizens board. It just, I think it's 12 years one has to live in Switzerland right now to be eligible for, to be able to apply for citizenship without guarantee. So I'm not surprised that the country is actually ruled by right-wing government, the nationalistic kind of chauvinistic government for years. It's a real disgrace. But Switzerland's not even a member of European community. Probably for that reason, if they were, they would have to really be, we have to be a, a, approved on the basis of certain changes made, uh, also in relation to immigration. Well, Christoph Wodicko, thank you very much, and we look forward to your, your next projects. Thank you. Uh, my next uh, project will probably be focusing again on the situation of war veterans, maybe next year. <laughs>